<coughs> a lie. What this means is now we reach this, what Lacan calls, decenterment of subjectivity. That when you are at your innermost yourself, you are not yourself, how should I put it? You are, you are lying, basically. That you are at a distance from truth. Which is why Lacan uses these words, I will not go into this Millerian topic that you mentioned, symptom, symptom, and so on, no. In this sense, at least for the male subject, it is how I understand Lacan's well-known motto that woman is a symptom of man. It doesn't mean, oh, woman is just my expression, I project into her, or whatever, whatever. It means something much more crazy. Uh, the key point is that for Lacan, the symptom pre-exists what it is a symptom of. This would be for me a beautiful poetic, beautiful poetic vision, for example. If woman is a symptom, to imagine a free woman going around, oh, who wants me as a symptom? Symptom in search of. Do you want me to be my symptom? Do you want me to be your symptom? No. And there even is a choice, a very authentic one, I claim, to choose to remain an empty, pure symptom. This would be something for, I don't know, a nun or whatever, which I think is a totally authentic position. None of the dirty psychoanalytic tricks here, oh, that woman must be frustrated and so on. I think this is false psychoanalysis. It can be a very radical feminine position. I will remain a pure symptom. Woman can do this, men cannot do it. It's men who is much more dependent and needs a symptom to be. For example, in Argentina I was told there is a poet who, in whose poetry there are clear shifts. Like 30 years ago he was kind of a conservative nationalist. Then when there were Monteneros he moved into radical terrorist left. Now he is a new ager. And a friend of this guy told me it's simple. He had three mistresses. First a nationalist, then, you know, this is woman as a symptom of man. He was <laughs> depending on her. He, he did it. In this way, now let me shock you with my bad taste. As they put it, you heard nothing yet. In this sense, I am tempted to, re to, to celebrate, to accept, don't kill me, uh, the film, not the novel. The novel is too much even, even for me. Da Vinci Code. Now, I don't buy, of course not, the, the theological aspect. All this, poor Christ uh, has to copulate up there and so on. I think that the best approach to this aspect would be the one developed apropos of X-Files by Darian Leader, the English Lacanian, you know, when he made a wonderful, simple insight. Maybe you know, he says, uh, why does in X-Files, why do so many things happen out there, aliens attacking all the time and so on, no? to cover up the fact that nothing happens here. It's absolutely <laughs> crucial that, remember, there is no sex between David Duchovny and who was Gillian Anderson, no? That's just to, to, to blur up this fundamental fact of the void here. What if we read in this exact way, not as, forget this divine dimension, it's even very vulgar. I mean, it's a humiliation for me that first they promise some terrible discovery which shatters the very foundations of Christianity and then you learn what? that Jesus was making love to Mary Magdalene. I claim that uh, secretly 95% of all Catholics know this and celebrate this. What's the news? If I may be a little bit obscene, if you want the true scandal, I hope at least it will be discovered that I don't know that Mary Magdalene was really a boy or what. That would be something, you know, <laughs> not this, no. But it's nonetheless not such a bad novel. Uh, sorry, film, why? What if you forget about that theological shit? And Reproach it as a kind of a primitive, simple, but effective psychoanalytic story. Obviously, the girl is frigid. It's clear in the novel she is totally desexualized. And the reason is even rendered clear. She witnessed so-called primordial scene. You remember, once she returned home when she was young, saw her, that grand-uncle paternal figure uh, in some stupid pagan ritual, whatever. Okay. So the key, key is the same, I think. Poor Jesus Christ has to copulate to cover up the fact that she doesn't. The same structure. What I like in the film now is that what I was afraid is that it would fall into this Hollywood formula of creating a couple, no? That like when, you know, this disgusting male chauvinist wisdom, women who don't, you know, 
or a woman needs is the right man to shake her up a little bit and, and so on. They avoided this. Again, no sex. It's even a very nice conclusion. You remember what's the solution? She accepts her role as leader of that uh, group in northern Scotland, Scottish town, I don't know where, which, who believe in her. That is to say, I claim it's really a nice film, if you read it this way, about a passage from Eros to Agape, from erotic to political love, political in the sense of community. And I like this very much, that I think it's an authentic solution for a woman. I don't think it, all this shitty psychoanalysis, oh, she must be frustrated, whatever, is false. It's even, although he's an idiot, but here it's good analysis that, you know, his message is not, if you observe, which is difficult, I admit it, Tom Hanks as an analyst, no? It's not, it's not, it's not, oh my God, Frigid, let's do something, and she will do it herself and stop thinking that poor Christ has to do it or whatever, no? No, the film respects this. Okay, but let me go now to the main line. So we have this abyss of subjectivity in the sense of uh, openness and so on. Of course, our elementary reaction to this is fear, especially today when the inexistence of the big other is more marked than ever. Not only the inexistence of the symbolic big other, in the sense of this abyss of language which has no guarantee and so on, but even, I think what is truly horrifying, if you ask me, in uh, ecology is uh, this kind of, how should I put it, uh, that nature itself as the ultimate big other is disappearing. In what sense? Phenomenologically, what is for us nature? It's some kind of a impenetrable density of our background. But isn't it that the moment you can, through, through, through genome, through biogenetic manipulations, the moment you can intervene in nature, into nature in this way, Nature itself turns into something, how should I put it, manipulable, reproduced. It's no longer nature in this sense of dense impenetrability. Now you will say, but wait a minute, we can do only a little bit of it. Yes, but the loss is here in the same way as, for example, here I disagree with people who are afraid of all this psychological to radical psychopharmaco manipulations in the sense of if somebody manipulates your your features, your innermost psychic feature, through pills or even through more radical biogenetic manipulations, you, uh, that it deprives you of your freedom. It's much more tragic, I think. Uh, let us say I can change, most primitive example, your mood and so on with serotonin. But if I can do it, doesn't this prove that your previous attitude was not your freedom, but it just depended on a different level of serotonin. You know what I mean? Once you can do it, the innocence is lost. It's not a choice between freedom and unfreedom. It's a choice just between, how to put it, blind dependency and the other kind of dependency. So I think this is the ultimate horror. And sorry, I don't have time to develop. It would be so nice to go into this. This is why I think Chernobyl was so horrible. No, it wasn't a simple catastrophe in nature. The point was that as if the very texture of nature is disintegrated. It's really as if, to go back to that metaphor, we see the stains for a moment. You know, it's not simply a catastrophe within nature. So, again, no wonder that today, when the big other is dissolving in all ways, even in politics, the predominant mode of politics is fear. What do I mean by this? Did you notice how not only the right-wingers, but practically across the entire spectrum of positions, if you, we have, let's call it zero-level politics, politics as expert administration and so on. The only way today, unfortunately, at least in the Western developed countries, to go a little bit up from it, that is to say, to mobilize people into some kind of a passionate movement, is, I claim, unfortunately, to mobilize them with reference to some kind of a fear. It can be in a more right-wing mood, uh, fear of immigrants, whatever. It can be fear of ecology. It can be victimization, harassment, again, ecological catastrophes, fear of state, taxation, fear of crime, fear of... 
it's fear which mobilizes us. And this fear, I claim, 